Uh, my name is Sean Anderson, and uh, I am an application transformation lead at Pivotal. Um, and I'll go into a little bit more detail what that means, but uh, we are here to talk about modernization patterns to get your applications to the cloud. Um, if anybody is in the wrong spot, feel free to run away now. So as I, I was asked to do the uh, fire exit announcement, is, have you guys seen this? Basically, note the exits nearest you in the event of a fire alarm, be calm, exit. Um, in the event of a water landing, your seats will become a flotation device, which is, which is very unlikely, but you know, we have to say it. But please follow the directions of any public safety staff. So who are the Pivotal App Transformation team? Um, Basically, we are a group of 45, now 50 engineers who specialize in adapting and creating tools for transforming applications, especially monoliths and, and uh, mission critical applications to the cloud. Um, we've been doing this for more than three years, which in this industry is a very long time. Um, we have done now more than 50 transformation engagements um, around the world. and. Uh, with each of these engagements, we create a, a collection of recipes that we put in our cookbooks. They're basically lessons learned and patterns to apply, um, and, and how do we continue to uh, rinse and repeat this process. A lot of these patterns that, that we've compiled over time, some of which you've seen out in the industry, the industry standard patterns, but what I'm going to talk to you about today is, is uh, all real world experience. Um, but it's also can be a very dry subject. So I'm going to enlist a amalgam character called Pete to help walk us through this. And uh, Pete basically represents um, a collection of customers. So I figured it might be a little bit easier to uh, digest some of this content if we have real world examples and uh, we have somebody that looks very hipster like Pete to walk us through this process. So who is Pete? Well, he is an enterprise architect at Widget Co., which I'm sure you've all worked at. Um, he maintains an order management system. Um, and in his spare time, he likes to read about microservice architecture and secretly dreams to apply some of these techniques to his business. Um, that's, that's something that I think most people have in common. But in Pete's world, he... Uh, he has some constraints. His order system is, uh, you know, a big hairy monolith. It's been something that has been created over time, um, usually since the 70s, for example. In Pete's case, there's some mainframe components. There's, of course, the ever popular um, components that are uh, tied to, you know, the latest hotness from 10 years ago, and then those people left, and and of course you have the you know system by acquisition. So so Pete really is is concerned with just keeping his job, keeping his system up and running. Now this this system is mission critical. It runs the business. Um, it's also like I said monolithic, and it needs to be up. So a whole bunch of nines, however many nines you want after the decimal point. That's what. Pete's bosses say. Um, and it, uh, of course, shares a mega database. This, this is a database that contains you know, the, the God tables. It's the storehouse of, of the world, basically. And Pete's, uh, Pete knows that changing applications means at some point changing the data. So what is Pete's problem? Well, his problem is that the C-suite understands that, hey, we need, to, we need to do some modernization. We need to be able to stay consistent and keep up with the competition. We have some problems, um, like we can't get software out the door quickly. Uh, you know, the bigger the applications get, the harder they are to maintain. Um, you know, like any other enterprise, there are, you know, QA departments, there's uh, performance departments, security departments, everybody has their gates to go to production. Um, and another way of saying gate is something thrown in your way to slow you down. And so Pete knows that, you know, the, the C-suite really wants us to, to go to the next step, and they don't necessarily understand that. 
So the C-suite says, hey, you know, the bosses want to keep the business running. Um, but then they also want a holistic approach, and they want to use DDD and agility and allow for innovation, cloud-native DevOps. Uh, so what, is, what does Pete then think about? Well, he's thinking a lot of things. The first one is, of course, buzzword bingo, and he won. But more importantly, he's thinking, these guys are monsters. This is, this is really, really challenging. Um, and they don't necessarily understand how challenging it is. So, you know, of course, they become sea monsters in his mind, but that's less important right now. So the next step then that Pete does is he understands that we need to get a direction, you know, a guiding principle, something that is the, the target. Um, there are processes that we at Pivotal use, um, like snap analysis, event storm, Boris diagrams. Those, those processes are something I'm not going to go into today, but the outcome of that is we have some sort of guiding principle, a direction to go um, to approach this problem. And that's really the first pattern here. Pattern zero is know where you want to go, um, not necessarily how you need to get there. And so that North Star, that direction, really is the, the notional architecture. Um, everybody in this room is, has experienced the you know, six-month-long architecture assessments where all you do is build uh, block diagrams and UML, and you try to anticipate everything that could possibly happen in your system and plan for it and design an architecture around it. Um, we found that that doesn't typically work really well because it's hard to get going. People you know, don't enjoy doing that. And most importantly, you don't know what you don't know. And the only way to get there is to have some sort of direction that is notional um, and start moving that direction and learn and, and expand as, as you go and, and have the courage to change that direction if it becomes necessary. Um, but for Pete, his choices were, well, we can do this all as a greenfield new application. We can do this big bang approach where in parallel, let's create the, the whole new ordering system, um, which from a developer's perspective is easier, but from a pragmatic business perspective, it is not easy um, because business has to keep moving on, right? You need to... Uh, um, you need to add new features, you need to keep development going, and very few companies want to invest the capital to actually double your budget to create something, um, to replace something in place. So typically, that means we want to do an incremental approach to this. And by incremental, that, that means simply that we may be taking thin slices of functionality and putting that to production and slowly over time evolve and strangle off the monolith or the, the uh, legacy application and start forcing workloads to be on the new platform. And uh, in this case, Pete wanted it running on Cloud Foundry for all the platform benefits that you folks are probably very aware of. So the Compass um, may give us a good idea of where we don't want to go. Uh, I kind of think of it as if we have an arc, you know, just a direction. We've eliminated three quarters of the directions out there that that's good enough. Um, we know where we don't want to go, so let's just go the other direction. So for Pete in this conversation, his North Star is Agile, DDD, um, the desire to get as close to cloud native as possible, but this is not always um, always the case. Sometimes you want to just do good enough. Maybe you get six-factor compliance instead of all 12 or 15 factors, and that's fine. Um, you know, it's more important to just get moving. Um, the, next, the next thing that he really wants to do is make sure you iterate. You know, small, small steps, um, aim small, miss small. So in, in Pete's case, it was really important to be able to let's start trying something and, uh, and have that feedback loop. You know, if things don't work or as we learn more information, you can start to evolve the architecture. You may evolve priorities, for example, and, and deprioritize some part of your application. 
um, and then minimize and manage the new tech debt. Now that's something that is, can be really challenging because what we're really trying to do here with these patterns is we're trying to replace tech debt. You know, this whole monolithic system is really technical debt and the more we add to that to enable our new features, um, the more we have to remove later. So, and finally, we have to keep the business running. So hopefully as we're going through this, um, we, can, we can start adding these thin slices of functionality and keep the existing business running without, uh, without fail. Remember all those nines, it's really important to keep those. So how's Pete gonna do it? Um, well, the first step he's gonna do is he's going to try to find seams in your system. Um, the, the seams, for example, can be <clears throat> API calls, message queues, um, just logical function calls, RMI, SOAP, REST, basically they're just places where it either physically or technology-wise makes sense that, hey, here's a break, here's something that is fairly easy to ca carve out. But it often is located or situated around uh, a capability of some sort. So even if you have applications that are calling each other with native Java calls, for example, you still might have a seam there because the functionality itself lends itself well to uh, being pulled into a, a new component. So with these seams in, in this order system, um, by identifying these thin slices of functionality or these, these bounded contacts, you're able to pull something out, right? So that's the goal, is we wanna be able to pull out some features, strangle off that monolith, um, but where do we put that capability? So now we've successfully identified here's a chunk of code or a chunk of functionality we're able to pull out, um, but we don't know where to put them. So we put that capability into our notional domain-driven design target. In this case, it may be a microservice. And this, this service may be very small to begin with. It may be basically a, a, you know, a, a framework that has a happy path thin slice through your ordering system, for example. But the important thing is now this is the first step of your new notional architecture. Um, but that leaves your ordering system with these, these dangling connections. You know, the existing order system now doesn't know how to talk to the, uh, you know, to your new functionality. So that's where we start to look at pattern two. And our pattern two is anti-corruption layer. And this really is just a pattern that allows you to um, wire up the uh, order system, you know, fill in the blanks for this missing block. And uh, sometimes the anti-corruption layers can be very complex because you may have um, interfaces or integrations with other systems that also depend on this functionality. So what that does for you is in this ACL, um, it gives you the ability to have like translation or composition layers, something that the old system knows how to talk to using the same, its same technique. You know, for example, if it makes a SOAP call today to some system, then the anti-corruption layer that we create will speak that same SOAP language, and it may translate the data, it may do some data composition, it may even make calls under the covers um, to other systems for you just for the sole purpose of making it work with your existing microservice. Um, and even validations, you know, things like that. So what that gives you is it, it makes it so you have um, fewer changes to your dependent systems. You know, typically when you have a monolith or you have something that the reason why you're, you're modernizing to the cloud is specifically because you can't get changes out the door quickly in your, in your current system, the last thing you want to do is try to require changes to that current system to enable your new, because now your changes aren't going to go in for four months or six months, and you have to go through all those hoops. So the Santa Corruption Layer gives you the ability to kind of sneakily inject yourself into the existing system and almost trick it into calling the new system. Um, and what it doesn't know won't hurt it, hopefully. It also gives you the ability to keep your new services pure and uh, create very robust tests and API driven test cases around it. Um, but more importantly, that anti-corruption layer can contain most of that new tech debt. And by tech debt, in this case, it might be those translations from SOAP to REST, or maybe it's um, taking a large canonical data object and stripping it down into small pieces that your new system can digest. 
And over time, what happens then is your, your ACL, you know, as you're moving more and more to production, um, eventually that piece will die on the vine. So your, your ACL will, will be running out there as a production application, possibly inside a Cloud Foundry as its own deployment. Um, but over time, as more and more um, new systems start using your, your new microservice, the old ones just kind of wither and die. And that's kind of the idea behind this strangulation. So um, over time, any new features, any new services that need your, your bounded context, your, your capability, your new business capability, they can start going through your new API and take advantage of all the Cloud Foundry um, scalability and, and stateless transactions, things like that. Um, and you don't have to ever call back into your old system. And that, that sounds... Uh, you know, very rosy. Now, in in practice, it's still very challenging. These are hard are hard subjects to uh, to solve. But this approach gives you the the next level down of how you can start peeling things off. Um, so, an example of another pattern here that forms, and you'll you'll see this kind of repetition. Um, where really our goal is to gain control over these seams. So um, if, for example, one of the seams you identify is, hey, this, this application uses message queues, that's one of the easiest things that we can do is start shunting these messages um, to our new systems. So what that allows us to do is say, okay, we have our new application, we put it into production, we've gone through all of our testing, we know that this app has a queue-based API and it does what we want it to, so now let's just start consuming messages off of that queue and then possibly telling the old system, hey, you no longer need to consume these messages. And you may do that even by tricking the old system to start listening to a dummy queue for example. And so you don't have to do code changes. You're just basically no longer giving it work to do. And eventually, that system will wither and die. It just isn't used anymore. So um, you can accomplish similar things with topics, or if you're using publish and subscribe. And this um, you know, common use cases of these event shunting, by the way, is we've had a lot of situations where people integrate with their mainframe using IBM MQ series. And your event shunt may be consuming messages off of MQ and then putting them on Rabbit for your new service. And that's totally fine. Really, it's just how can I be sneaky and make sure that the old system thinks it's working exactly the way it was, and now I've translated things to my new um, North Star environment. So with topics and publish and subscribe, it could be the same exact thing. So we have our new service, and he is subscribed to this topic. So now there are components getting the same message in two places. But at some point, we know that there is, um, from our, our old service, there's a point where he's putting messages on a queue for downstream consumption. In this case, we just simply say, great, let's, let's just um, simulate that. We'll make sure that our service at the end of its processing now, you know, continues on that downstream. Really, it, it becomes just a matter of black box. What came in before and what goes out is what we care about, so let's just simulate that same process. And now again, we've shunted off all of the work from that uh, component, that thin slice in your monolith, and it can wither and die again. So, there's other ideas here where, of course, we don't have um, message queues. So we may be looking at things like proxies or facades and adapters. All of these are very similar concepts, and I'll go through these one at a time. But essentially, um, what we're trying to do is, is the same thing we did with event shunting, but we're taking these microservices that currently are being pointed to by a particular or not being pointed to by a particular client. And we're saying, hey, let's, let's inject a proxy. Let's put a piece in there so when they're making these REST or SOAP calls, um, we change the configuration to point to the new service. And the new service simply is a pass-through to the old. Um, and when we do that, that instantly gives us control. So now everything's going through our new proxy. And we can then wire that up and say, awesome. Now, as things are going through this, this proxy, um, I, can, I can decide if I want to route it to the old service, route it to the new, 
Um, there's a lot of uh, deployment patterns that let us say, with this proxy, I want to route, say, 10% to my new system, just to make sure that I know it's working the way it should be. The other 90% can still get routed to the old. But again, it gives us that capability of, of now controlling the, uh, the flow of the applications. Um, a facade is similar to a proxy, but usually it has to do a lot more work to make things happen. Um, in, in Pete's case here, he has an application that's running in a web logic environment, and it's using RMI to talk to other components inside of this web logic system. And that sounds, yeah, that sounds very complicated. You're using RMI. We can't easily, you know, have, make an RMI call into the cloud. How do we, how do we handle this? Um, so again, we have our microservices already out there, and we could create an RMI facade. And really what an RMI facade in this case is, is a piece of code, a chunk of application that, that implements the same interface that uh, the existing RMI target does. And uh, we, we tell the, the new service, now talk to the, the new RMI component. So, so really you're just, uh, um, you know, you're, you're throwing a decoy in. Now, this RMI service, it may be necessary to have him running inside of the web logic environment, for example, and that's fine. Maybe it's an EJB that, that you deploy out there that the EJB has code in to then make REST calls on your behalf. So that's, that's all fine. It's just now you have that facade where, again, it's, it's the place where your tech debt lives, um, and it's doing this transformation. Um, one thing you'll note is as we're doing this, we, we're able to now start injecting instrumentation and monitoring and, and um, logging in each of, these, each of these patterns, each of these layers. You're starting to see that now that we have control, we can actually learn and understand more about how our application's used because most of the time people's big hairy monoliths don't have log aggregation and, and uh, good instrumentation and monitoring. So we're getting control there. Um, the next one is an adapter, which is also similar to proxy and facade, where in this case, let's say uh, um, Pete has some downstream systems that he makes calls to, or maybe they're, they're dependent systems. He's making a call to a customer um, application or even a CRM tool, something like that. And our microservice then also needs to consume data from that, similar to like a database. So our adapter can be put in place that speaks the same language as the downstream service, um, and then it can convert our more native REST calls or whatever we decide is our transformation or our application uh, protocol. And that adapter then is really just a wrapper around this external service. And the same benefits um, apply here where that adapter has you know the consolidated logging it's got all of the instrumentation so now we're able to get some analytics out of the application as a side effect of being able to gain control here so um, the last pattern I think I'll have time to talk about here is gateways and gateways are similar to proxies in that they they will take traffic from an external source and route it through to your to your backend services. Um, Zool is very popular for building your own gateways, one of the Netflix OSS um, stack applications. Also Apigee, MuleSoft, Boomi. <clears throat> Basically, what we're doing with the, uh, with the gateway is where a consumer today may be talking to our system directly or through, uh, through our existing API layer. Um, we may want to uh, say, let's, let's do the same thing we did with proxies. Let's have that consumer talk to a gateway. Um, you may have applications where they're already using a gateway like Apigee or something to do security endpoints and, and uh, do some of the control of your access. But if not, we can, we'll plug in a gateway here that says, now we're going to be intercepting these calls again from the consumer. So we've gained control from that seam that we identified. And once we have control of that, we can let the gateway do this routing. So an end user or maybe an external customer, um, say you're a cell phone provider and you have partners that you enable to access your systems to be able to register new customers, things like that. Those APIs can't change to the customer. So we do that in the gateway layer. And our backend then is now isolated 
and, con and you can continue your development and your, your fast processing through that. So in summary, um, the, the way I look at doing these patterns is similar to if you've ever been driving and you notice that you know, they're widening the highway and you have an overpass. And in that uh, overpass, they're widening it to three lanes. And what typically they do is they'll build a bridge wider next to that traffic, and then they start routing the traffic through to the new service, you know, to the new, um, the new bridge, and then they could tear down the old. It's the same kind of thing. Um, I've had people say, hey, to me, it's like a heart transplant. You know, you pull the heart out, and you have to route the blood through this machine. And I don't like using that analogy because it seems a little self-serving. We're not that important to compare ourselves to heart surgeons, but you get the same idea. Um, so really, in summary, we're trying to gain control at the seams. Um, we're using anti-corruption layers, which can be a facade or a proxy or an event shunt or something built specifically for translation. And that helps us keep that tech debt isolated, and it helps minimize the probability that we have to change the system we're trying to strangle. Um, and over time, your monolith gets strangled. It just simply stops being used. You don't even necessarily have to pull code out. You just stop using that, that chunk of the application, and your dragon is tamed. And finally, the ACLs over time can just die on the vine because they are no longer used. So in Pete's case, um, his result was, hey, we've got applications in Cloud Foundry. Um, most of the time, you can start within a couple months and actually get large portions of your monolith strangled. Our goal is two weeks or a week to get usable code in production. Um, but the bottom line is this is a very hard problem to solve. Um, the key to Pete's success was he kept an eye on his guided pr guiding principles. You know, it's, we're going this direction. Sometimes you do things that looks ugly and there's a little dirtiness in there. Let's just try to contain our dirtiness to some place where it's not going to bite us down the road or bite somebody else down the road. Um, and of course, be agile, iterate, learn, adapt, <clears throat> and uh, break things into manageable chunks. But in Pete's case, the biggest key to his success was his company's commitment to making this work. And that's why the iteration is very important, because you can prove to those sea monsters in the C-suite that, hey, we know what we're doing. We actually have repeatable feedback quickly. You don't have to wait eight months. Um, and uh, that's, how, that's how Pete became successful. And that is it. So Pete's happy. Thank you.